first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for the slightly uh, non-existent uh, slides that we have up here. I hope it'll go on. Now it's there. Okay, so, so first of all, I'd like to apologize slightly for the uh, slightly pretentious title of Beyond AI. Just like the couple of talks that have been here on machine learning AI in the morning, uh, starting with Danny and, and also Wendy, there are these sort of questions. What's, what is beyond the standard methodologies that we are using now in uh, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning? What's, what's the next step and what is so, so, so beyond sort of just taking these algorithms and implementing them on our everyday sort of work experiences? What, what will come next? And so, so the topic of today, I'll try to sort of make some connections between the first couple of talks, Wendy and, and Danny. And unfortunately, I had a, a, a flight mix up, so I came a little bit late, so I didn't actually see them, but I, I've seen some talks from them. So I'll refer to them, and, 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 and maybe, maybe they talked about this or some, something similar. So, so in the first talk with Danny, there was this discussion of, of uh, how do we reach this sort of general, domain general AI? How can we train? and make an efficient framework of training not just sort of the simplest tasks, not just the visual tasks, but really something that uh, mimics all of the different environments that we are. And games is what he sort of identifies, coming from Unity Studios, as one of the sort of main uh, uh, opportunities that we have now, putting in the machine learning algorithms in there, and then having the, the let's say, the physics simulation engines available so that we can actually start to have Complex, uh, complex tasks being solved real time with computational power available. And then, and then there was a sort of a shift with Wendy who, who said, okay, let's get the human in the loop. So, so we have to start considering what is it that the role of the human will be in these interactions. So um, maybe, uh, maybe Danny talked a little bit about imitation learning um, in which you can say that you can use these games in a way where you let the humans play these games and then the, the computer takes inspiration from that and then sort of trains itself using that inspiration. And, and so what I will be doing in this talk is to try to combine those two. So I'll, I'll combine the features of the games uh, and then the, the concept of the human in the loop. So the question of asking what kind of an interface is it in the future that we need to create, not to create artificial intelligence, but to create, so, so it has many names, I call it hybrid intelligence, uh, intelligence augmentation, in which we bring the human into the loop and then we uh, 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 have the best of both worlds. And so my talk will really be sort of taking one step back and then finding out how do we find out what the best of the two worlds are. So what kind of, what kind of tests do we need to do now in order to examine what is it that the computers are particularly well suited for today and also tomorrow? And what is it that uh, at least we humans were better at uh, 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 sort of previously, but also what we will remain to be sort of special at? And this is sort of the, the potential for these hybrid intelligence interfaces. And compared to, to those two talks, um, so, so there are two sort of, let's say, main talks, the main points that I want to give, and, and one of them is that this general domain, general uh, uh, AI training, using games is really fantastic. I talked a little bit about this imitation learning, and it's really fantastic to say that we just have any kind of work environment or task or challenge, and then we have the human solving it, and then alongside that, we have the computer who has a much more sort of, a, let's say, memory capacity and can see the patterns, and we can use all the advanced algorithms to extract the best out of the human performance. And then at some point, we can actually step back, and then the computer has actually learned everything that the computer uh, wanted to learn. And so the point that I'll get back to is that that can be the case in many, set many settings, but when we start to enter the real world, this is not always the case, because very often we will be in a setting in which we have very limited, let's say, trials available. So the cost of running one iteration may be very expensive, and then we need to rethink what it means to be learning, because we can't just sort of throw the current machine learning algorithms edit in which we say, okay, we have a human playing at once and then we have a computer playing at 100,000 times if each playthrough takes a day even for a computer or to run it. So in that case, we really need to, the challenge of the future, as I see it, is really to extract features from how it is that we learn. So rather than sort of big data processing, maybe sort of focus on smart processing. So how is it that we humans process information and then it becomes these intuitive leaps of faith. 
And so understanding those, those better is really what, um, what, what, what my main mission is, very much linked to, to, uh, to the messages that you heard if you were at Wendy's talk. The second thing that I think is the main sort of uh, take-home message is that if we want to have people contributing to solving these big, big challenges of finding out what it means to be human and what, it, uh, what, what the sort of the unique capabilities are, then we need something to motivate them. And one way is to just create games that are fun. Uh, and then while you are playing these fun games, then you are also contributing to training a machine learning algorithm. Uh, but my point that I will sort of try to make is that if we really want to sort of engage people, then we want to engage them into something bigger, into some epic goals. And this is where we are using something called citizen science, in which we are trying to encapsulate these games as something that solves, at the same time as playing these games, you solve some global challenges. And so that means that we have this epic mission that we can engage the, the players and the humans in. Okay. So, so, so first, uh, just a, a one slide on, on sort of the status of AI machine learning. So, so in this room we can call it machine learning and, 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 and so uh, this is not to, to, to be sort of, uh, 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 well, uh, to shock you or anything. I know I, know I wouldn't be able to shock you uh, by, by the introduction of sort of the singularity. Uh, I just want to mention sort of one of my favorite uh, examples of the uh, sort of what has been going on in the deep learning community over the past few years, and that is this uh, paper coming out of the uh, Google DeepMind project in 2014, in which they uh, played, uh, they, they had their DQN algorithm play the uh, old 80s Atari games. And, and maybe Danny mentioned it sometimes in some of his talks, he mentions it, that there's, that there's a particular game which is called uh, Breakout, which is very illustrative. So in this algorithm, in all of these games here, uh, the algorithm was just fed the pixel values and then using reinforcement learning had to learn by itself the rules of the game. And there's this game in which you have the breakout and then you have all these small uh, uh, bricks and you have to hit them and then there's videos out there showing how fantastic it does. Okay, so those, those you see, you, you, you may have seen, I don't know if you've looked into the paper, but if you look into the paper, I think this curve here is really fascinating because this is the one that sort of is like a status quo of human and machine intelligence sort of contrasted against each other because here we have the roughly 35 different games that the DQN algorithm attacked and then there's a line here that says this is human level or above. So that means that everything up here is what the algorithms mastered with very little training to human level or above and this is really sort of the, you can say, the remaining challenge. So the pessimistic view, if, if I was about to shock you and you were uh, not as educated in machine learning as, as, as you are, uh, then I could say that, okay, this is a, this is a unique time in mankind, right, because uh, just a, a couple of, a, a decade or two ago, this line here was all the way up here and we were the supreme beings on, on, on Earth and we are the sort of fortunate people a fortunate generation that gets to experience sort of this line climbing further and further and further down, and that's what we call the singularity. Anyway, so so uh, again, also not to, to scare you, but but to uh, because, uh, but but to phrase a couple of questions. Um, the historian uh, Yuval Novel Noah Harari has put sort of a couple of possible futures for mankind out there, and so so one of them is that this AI singularity comes. Uh, and, and then there's no real need for us anymore. Uh, the second one is much more interesting, so, so, so sort of interesting for a debate on what we think, the, which kind of a society we want to drive it into. And that is that we will in the future be depositing more and more decisions with the uh, AI and slowly uh, it will be taking over control in the sense that we still solve some challenges, but it's really the algorithms that are deciding what kind of challenges we should be pursuing. And so I had a, I had a personal experience with that. I gave a talk in, in, in Copenhagen a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think it was, and then I was driving back in the, uh, on the freeway, and, and then at some point on the freeway, uh, the navigation system said, uh, go, get, off the, get off the freeway and drive on the very small uh, sealand roads. And, and so I did that, trusting as I am, and so I drove on those roads, and then when I was driving on those roads, I could look at the kilometers and kilometers of line there was because they had shut down the whole country because there was this manhunt that maybe some of you saw, right? And so what happened there was that I had a good experience with, with the recommendation uh, algorithm, 
And so that means the next time I'll trust it again, and the next time uh, in a couple of years when we have self-driving cars, then I will also trust that algorithm, and I will also trust it to just find its way for me. And, and the interesting part is that at that point, something really interesting happens to mankind, because before we had sort of humanism in the sense that, that every, every person we believe is sort of unique, especially sort of, let's say, uh, well, so, so, so every person is unique, and, and we want our algorithms to make choices on behalf of us that sort of are to the best of us. But what happens when we have um, Waze or, 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 or Google traffic or some system that is now managing all of the self-driving cars, and then I have my personal assistant that decides where I should go, right? So if I'm driving on the freeway and I know that it's blocked, then the best choice for me is to be sent out on the small roads. But then if this system is at, sa at the same time controlling everyone else's cars also, then it's actually uh, uh, not the best thing to do what is best for the individual, because then everything is done to that, to this, to everyone, and everyone is sent out on the small sealand roads, and there's an even bigger congestion there, right? And so it doesn't, maybe it doesn't seem that profound, but I think it's really profound what happens there, because we will see a shift where the algorithms will have to make decisions, not behalf on, on behalf of us, so what will be best for us, but what will be best for the whole sort of, let's say, collective of humans. And so, so that's why it's so profound that, that when we start to deposit enough, there will be this shift where we cannot sort of, uh, that where the uniqueness of humans will start to be attacked. So he's, he's writing about this in this book, uh, Homo Deus, if you haven't read it. And then the second thing, uh, the reason that the book is called Homo Deus is that the third thing that he says that might happen is that we will see human augmentation being able to happen in which you can uh, put in, let's say, uh, you can extend your lifetime if you're rich enough by maybe within a decade or two, you can pay, pay enough money and then you, you can extend your lifetime by one decade, not become immortal, but you can do that decade by decade. And this means that what he's saying is that what may happen is that within a few decades, we will actually have seen these rich people evolving into such an extent that it will no longer be the species Homo sapiens, but a new, entirely new species, which is this upgraded species, Homo Deus. And so what will happen in that future is that we will have uh, the algorithms and then the Homo Deuses, the rich people, controlling everyone else. And so, so if you're poor, it's not so good. So, so, so those are, uh, this is just not, again, not the idea is, um, there's lots of scary talk and everything, so that's not, the, that's not the point. But it really does phrase some questions of what kind of a society is it that we want to do. And when we are working with all these algorithms, what is it that we want to, to be doing? And, and again, my main point is that this is sort of a unique time in which we can take control and we can shift our focus from entirely focusing on making algorithms more and more efficient to putting, as Wendy says, it, the, more, the human into the loop and making... Uh, conscious efforts to design more and more systems in which we optimize the use of our own sort of brains. And so the, the comfort that I get personally is that the more we turn to psychology and the study of the human brain, the more we fig figure out that we have no idea what's going on inside of the brain. So there's so much undiscovered potential inside of the brain. I have one sort of favorite psychology experiment that illustrates this, I think, very nicely. And that's sort of some, so there's a psychology experiment in which you have a number of connected gears. And the idea is you turn the first one clockwise, and then the challenge is what's, what's the rotational property of the last one, clockwise or counterclockwise? And so the fascinating thing about this experiment was that it was a psychology experiment. The children who were doing it digitally were sort of monitored. And it turned out that they were playing it in a particular way, all of them. So they were just tracing it out with their finger like this here. And then they found out how the last one was. OK, and, and half of you are laughing right now, I can see. And that's because you are smiling, because you know that this could be done much more efficiently. Right? So you look at this, and then you quickly count whether there's an even number or an odd number, and then you know. And these children, they were, they were, of course, also not stupid. So after playing around a little bit, they also discovered that you could do this in another way. But the fascinating thing was that at the instant that they had this discovery, this innovation, their eyes did like this. So they had an outwards reaction to the inwards process of generating a new idea. And, and as a physicist, so I'm a quantum physicist, as a physicist, I would have said, oh, that's really cool. Let's publish this and tell the world about it. But, but what they did, the psychologists, they were also clever and more clever than me. So they said, ah, oh, let's make a game 
in which uh, at some point there's a star appearing here and a star appears, so a random point, but at the same time, a star here, a star here, a star here, and then the, the children's eyes did like this, like this, like this, like this, and then they could document that they discovered this algorithm. <coughs> so that means that we have so much that we don't understand about the human brain that there's this connection between our, let's say, conscious way of thinking and then our embodied way of thinking, where, where we use so many sensory expressions and we have no idea how this is all connected together. And so this richness is really something that we can ask about question, how can we exploit that in the future? And can that become the sort of the richness of inter us interacting with the machine? So we can imagine sort of um, training in, in the future, we may have these, these rooms in which uh, every development department has this, L, this, this device that, that if I've built it, then I'm rich, that, that it's sort of on the wall in which that's an indicator of how close we are to having a new idea, right? So, it, so being in a development div division in, in five or ten years, if, if this comes true, could be, really, could be really boring because all you're doing is that you're sort of interacting, but you're always looking up at that indicator, and that indicator tells you, oh, we're actually very close to having a new idea, and then everyone is much more inspired, and then you get that idea even faster. So, so, so that's sort of just a, uh, if we can start to learn what all these different impressions are, then that is really something that we can, can master. If we want to do that, now again, sorry for this being a sort of a, a, a technical, technical talk and then having all of this sort of human, human uh, 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 and liberal arts kind of stuff, and, 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 but, but it's really important for us to understand what is it then that goes on in our minds. If we want to understand that, then we really have to, so some uh, AI researchers are saying that if we really want to understand what the next step of AI should be, then we have to turn back to psychology, human psychology, and just study basic psychology and understand it much, much better. That's yeah, also sort of a reason why, why sort of the Google DeepMind department uh, uh, sweeps up all of the cognitive neuroscientists and not so many people are going the other way around because there's so much inspiration right now coming from how neural computation actually works into these algorithms. And so here's a, just a, a brief sort of overview of it. Uh, if you want to, you can read this, this book here that gives sort of an overview of, of Kahneman, the way he thinks about it. And so he thinks of the human brain as sort of having, this not locations, but it has sort of a system one and a system two way of thinking. And the system one way of thinking is this very fast, unconscious, uh, these quick decisions, the gut decisions, whereas we have the system two, which is the slow, we've cal calculated it. And, and when we talk about intelligence, very often, uh, let's say in, in, in a couple of decades ago, what is intelligence, what is the supreme of human intelligence, we would place all of it over here, right? We would place all of it in system two, where we say the most intelligent people are the people who are rational, the people who can play chess or go or something like that, and can really understand all of these different, let's say, think not just four steps ahead, but maybe even 15 steps ahead, right? Those are the most supreme beings on Earth because they're so intelligent. But then at the time when we start to... Uh, to get algorithms that can do the same thing and even better, then we start to say, ah, well, that's probably not really human intelligence because games like these, like Go and chess, they're really made ideally for computer algorithms, right? It's very simple game rules and then a huge state space. And no human brain can keep up with all of that. And we're not supposed to. So what we see is that intelligence, or let's say artificial intelligence, machine learning, is sort of challenging what we mean by human intelligence and making us sort of redefine that in that process. And so this is, this is sort of my way of saying it. So we, we have sort of a loop here in which we have uh, the computers now really sort of very often what we see in the algorithms is taking the role of this system too. And then what we're seeing as challenges for, for instance, just self-driving cars and everything is really to encapsulate all of the sort of uh, the intuitive decision making then this pattern making that we sort of do subconsciously. And so this is also where the domain sort of fluffy, let's say, creativity, innovation, intuition lies. And the question that we ask sort of in my center is, can we do sort of systematic tests and find out what is it really that we mean when we say creativity, intuition, and innovation? This is what we call hybrid intelligence to sort of uh, close that loop and, and have the best of, of both of those two worlds. And so what becomes in this hybrid intelligence future not the AI future, but the HI future, what becomes important is that we understand much, much better how we define interfaces. And this comes back to the Wendy and sort of finding out what is the optimal interface that allows human creativity to, to sort of flourish. And so many of you, some of you may have seen this curve here. It's very, very simple. And it's just sort of the sweet, the sweet spot of creativity in the sense of you have a, a system and then what is your potential for creativity as a function of how constrained you make that problem. 
And it's sort of clear that if you make this extremely constrained, then it's what you call over-constrained, and you don't really have any choices left. And if you, uh, so this is, this is sometimes called the, the engineering part of it, where it's, all, it's extremely specified, and this over here would be sort of art, in which you can do anything you want. But if you can do anything you want, again, it's very hard to sort of be, uh, uh, be constructively uh, uh, creative. And so there's this sweet spot. What does that mean for a general interface? We have no idea, and that's what we're trying to, to sort of investigate. And so we investigated, as I said, with this process called citizen science. So what we try to do is we try to create games that encapsulate challenges from, uh, let's say, either development, sort of complex uh, corporate development challenges or scientific challenges from the university levels, and then try to encapsulate that into games so that uh, humans can, not without, not because they have training, but because they are sort of intuitively approaching this system from a different point of view, start to solve that. So uh, I think it was Herbert Simon who said something like, every problem is simple. Every problem in the world is simple once you know the solution to it. Right? And that is the truth that all of the different problems really in machine learning, everything else, optimization, really relies on the crucial thing that you need to do is to change your perspective. Which perspective? If it's machine learning, we might call it dimensionality reduction. Right? So what our principal component that has, something like that. So, so you have this multidimensional problem, and the key to solving that problem is really to identify the right ways of viewing it, let's say the, the right dimensions in which that is. And so that's what we're trying to sort of find out, what kind of interface can allow for that. When we do that, then we play on this, uh, 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 the, the, the landscape metaphor for an optimization problem. Uh, can I just see a show of hand? How many are, are familiar with the optimization metaphor for, uh, so the landscape metaphor for an optimization problem? Okay, half. So, so, so I think if you if you haven't if you don't do anything, then I would recommend sort of taking this home as a as a as a message. That is, I think that's very constructive to to think of all these optimizations. You have whichever optimization problem it is in the world, and then you define these axes. And let's take a very simple control problem. So you have two different control variables x and y, and then for each of the x comma y's, you have a solution given that point in the landscape, and the solution quality is the height of this here. And so if you have this metaphor here, that could be in two dimensions or in a thousand dimensions, but e that means that every, solving every challenge just means crawling around in this landscape here and searching for, let's say, the highest point in this landscape. And that's what all of machine learning is all about, let's say, let's, uh, not all, but this is what, what a lot of machine learning is, is about, optimization, is then to do this balance between exploration and exploitation. Exploitation would be, I just sit somewhere and then I just crawl uphill. It's very, very efficient and very, uh, very simple to do, but then if I only crawl uphill, then I will be caught in, in one of these foothills. So the big challenge of all machine learning algorithms is to find out how do we place in this random component to make sure that we explore the whole landscape. And so the question that we ask is, can humans maybe find out the structure of this landscape and then Creativity, does that really mean taking jumps into the unknown, but not completely random jumps into the unknown, sort of qualified jumps into the unknown, in which you make jumps that have some have a higher probability of success than otherwise if you just did it randomly. And this is where we can hopefully also inspire each other, let's say the human and the algorithms, in making all these jumps. So taking any problem, and, uh, and that could be, so, so let's go back to, 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 to a corporate setting, then we say, okay, so we have, we have the, the, the engineers at, at, at Apple, and they are designing the, app, uh, the iPhone 11, and they have two different choices, or they have to balance between two different choices. One of them is to take the iPhone 10 and then make small iterative changes to that and stick with what they know. That means climbing uphill here, and then they have the other one, which is just say, okay, let's get crazy, have this re so at least a small period of time in which we just do something crazy, which means they just jump somewhere out here in this landscape, and then they can start to iteratively improve on that, and then the question, what does that land with? Does that land with something which is better or worse? So any challenge will be this balance between what's called exploration and exploitation. And, and, uh, and so, um, so this is what we then use as studies for games. So, so we use it in games, and, and this becomes... Uh, multi-dimensional, multi, uh, uh, 
disciplinary very quickly because we then have to uh, uh, sort of involve all these different divisions and that has been sort of hard work for me at, at the university to put together all of those and it's still hard work to, to find contracts for all of these people uh, but we are trying to manage so we have now in my group sort of a, a, a small mini company inside of the university with uh, 10 developers and we're producing these games uh, that, that can be played by the community. So here's one, one example of, of the first game that we made. So I'm a quantum physicist, and, and I'm trying, I have an, a lab in the basement in Aarhus, and I'm trying to create something called a quantum computer. If you know what a quantum computer is, great. If you don't, pretend that I talk for 10 or 15 minutes about how fantastic it would be for the world if we created a quantum computer, because there will be almost in, uh, endless computational power available. And pretend also that you know now that I, what I do in the lab is that I pick up an individual atom using a light tweezer, and then I transport it around in the lab. And the problem is that just like you see there, when you pick up something which is a sloshy liquid like this one here, which is a quantum atom, uh, then it starts to, to slosh, and this gives us errors in our computation. So what we did then, rather than uh, relying solely on computer algorithms, was to, uh, to phrase it in the form of this game here, and then people could play the game. And so the question was, can we use and exploit the intuition of people to generate these solutions, because maybe we have this intuition for running around with liquid, so we are late for a meeting, and we have our coffee cup in the hand, and we are just r r running, and, and maybe we have some embodied way of thinking about these problems that we could exploit. Oops, no, I don't want to see you. Um, and and so, so a result came out in 2016, uh, where we published that, that compared to the algorithms that we had been using so far in the field, uh, uh, the, the, we could get lots of inspiration from the humans in playing this game. And, and when I started this effort, I always thought that if I create these games, maybe I can get a couple of hundred thousand people to play this, and then I would be lucky, and one person would be a genius who just had some giftedness inside of him or her, and I would find a good solution from that. And the big surprise was that rather than finding that genius, we sort of discovered the genius in all of us, and that was that when we looked at how humans play it, they just play the game radically different than how we encoded our algorithms before that. So looking at that behavior, nearly everyone, we could take every, every player's inspiration for a new way of doing it that was better than what we knew before. And so uh, Los Angeles Times wrote, take that AI video game or solve quantum physics mystery using human intuition. And so now the question came, okay, human intuition, what is this human intuition and how can we sort of uh, understand that better? And so, so, uh, so one of the things that we were uh, uh, attacked for by, by, by people who, who, who didn't like our project that much, they said, it's a, it's a fine project, it's fun, uh, but it's not very generalizable because in any corporate settings or in any university setting, how many of the challenges have a clear water analogy or any other, let's say, classical physics analogy that just means that we have intuition for that. So, so if we can only create games that are useful from challenges that have a clear, clear sort of, let's say, uh, intuitive metaphor, then, then the, the range of, of options for that is very uh, limited. So in order to test that, we did another thing. Uh, we created another game. And this other game, well, this is very, so call it game. this is the game. So, so you have remote control of my experiment in Aarhus. Uh, and what you're controlling is then the laser intensity and magnetic fields as a function of time. So you are, you're really sort of the gameplay is to drag these curves around and then press submit, and then you press submit, and then that solution, pro so, so the, that suggestion gets sent to my lab, it's executed in the lab, we take the picture of the atoms, we count how many cold atoms you create, and then about a minute later, you get feedback and say, okay, you got so and so many, and then you could, put, could continue in that loop. So it's extremely boring, and, and then, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, so we need, that's, that's my point, right? That is that if we want to do tasks like these, then we need something epic, right? And so, but, but for them it wasn't boring because they were controlling an actual experiment. They were really doing something. They were participating in, in solving something, but they didn't learn anything. They didn't get any intuition or, uh, or anything. So, so this is, the, this is the, the setup. We have the solutions here. We send it to the lab, and then we execute it. And, and so this is the result in which we try to compare how the algorithms that we sort of so we teamed up with with the uh, the best theoreticians on the f in the field and we said okay so you get remote control and your algorithms can now control the experiment you can optimize it so so before we did anything this is supposed to be 10 to the 6 so we had about 2 million atoms when my my phd students were finished optimizing it and and then the, the players, they got uh, so almost 50% extra. Uh, so that means that within very, very small time, 
with this access to this interface, this game, they could find solutions that my PhD students and I couldn't find during a year of optimization. And moreover, they also found better uh, uh, results than, than, the, uh, than the theoretical algorithms that we had. And so what we can start to do now is that we can look at what is it that, so, so here is just sort of histograms of how the algorithm behaves and how the humans behave, and then we can do social science statistics on that, and then we can show something, that, so this just came out in PNES um, uh, last week, and, and so the nice thing about this is that we are now for the first time sort of taking this social science where you study humans onto a massive scale and then trying to find out something in real world settings. And so what we, what we could di discover here was that the humans were very efficient at optimizing this problem because they had access to each other's solutions. And so what they did was they implemented a multi-agent search algorithm, which you can call adaptive search, in which the best performing agents, the best performing players, they did iterative small improvements and they sort of did exploitation. Whereas if you were further down the, the, the ranking, then you would be much more prone to taking large steps into the unknown. So that means the collective of the humans that were the high performers with the low performers meant that we got this, both the advantage of climbing uphill and also those jumps out into the unknown. And so now we can start to, this is just sort of studies, but then we can start to, to, to put more and more sophisticated algorithms and we can start to contrast that. And maybe when we take our greediness in, when we set the settings for our greediness in our machine learning algorithms, we can soon take inspiration from how would humans do this. So I've also been talking to, there's a, there's a project called the Human Brain Project, uh, where they're trying to create an artificial brain. And so they, they, wanted to, they, they wanted to get together enough neurons that they could really sort of have as, and, uh, as many neurons as we have in the human brain. And, and they're about there now, but I talked to the, to the leaders of the team and they have, although they've assembled this, they have no idea how to put together this system architecture in order to get human behavior out. And so one of the things that we're talking to them about is having humans play some games and then having this sort of artificial neural network playing these games. Now it's an artificial but real neural network, right? Uh, um, uh, that uh, electronic network that, uh, that we can then use sort of in a loop to reconfigure how the system architecture should look like so that we can start to reproduce not the results but the behavior of humans. So reproducing behavior of humans is really something I can think is, is very promising. So, so I just also wanted to mention one other thing for this. One of our top players was a retired uh, Italian microwave systems engineer. And so, uh, so, so he played it really well, and we asked him, okay, so what, why is it that, you, what, how do you play this game? And he said for him, the playing this game was exactly like being a microwave systems engineer. Because in 30 years of being a microwave systems engineer, he never understood microwave systems. Okay, so, so he spent his entire lifetime not understanding that box. It was a black box for him, but what he got really good at was black box optimization. So getting back to this optimization landscape, what he, what, what maybe he didn't realize that at the time, but then in the conversations, what he realized was that what experience meant to him, what intuition and gut feelings meant to him, was that he had gotten, acquired the skill of remembering these inputs that he had sent into the black box, collecting them together, and somehow having some sort of intuition for what that means for, 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 for which kind of steps we should take. And so we have discussions with, with, with companies about maybe sort of going out and having um, learning sessions in which we take the engineers and, and everyone sort of involved in a process like this and then make people much more aware that what, what are the steps that go into to, to having sort of, so what, what are the steps? Oh, let me tell, let me tell you a story about the, so I was in a, in a, big, in a, in a big company uh, in, in, in Uland. We don't have so many of them and, and, and not too many of them produce uh, playful tools uh, that you can put together. So, 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 it's, um, so we talked to, talk to the, the lead developer, uh, the lead technical engineer of this division and, and also the human development officer. And then the, the, the tech officer said, in my division, we never make any decisions based on gut feelings. We always do the rational thing, so system two, right? And so the human development officer said, we have a lot of these people retiring and we have a huge problem because we cannot, no matter how much we try, extract what they, how they work, their work experience. And I said, okay, well, that's probably because you do lots of gut feelings, but then the culture is that we don't do gut feelings at all. Uh, we only work rationally. So, so that means that if we can sort of make people aware of all the choices that they're making and make that sort of fit into a framework, then maybe, one, we can make better decisions, make more informed decisions, but maybe also share those experiences much better and sort of train new colleagues much better. 
So I think that's that's very promising to to sort of head in that direction. Um, so here's here's another problem. That's the last of the problems the, from from the social sciences, uh, from the natural sciences that I'll talk about. So so we're we're trying to find out uh, NP hard problems, uh, which are uh, uh, notoriously uh, uh, pretty hard problems uh, that that uh, are sort of these scheduling networks. You have this complex network. You have conditions that need to be fulfilled, and 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 they are just sort of provably hard. Uh, so, so there's no way to find the best solution very, uh, very more efficiently. But then you can ask the question: Are there what are the best what are the best ways of coming up with nearly optimal solutions? So, pretty good solutions to these problems. And so, what we're trying to do now is to to phrase these questions as a game. And and so, so I think for me it was at least a wonderful experience because we teamed up with some people who had been working on this for ten years. And, uh, and then we said, okay, let's, in my division, we'll create a game. So the lead developers, they made this game. And then the lead developer was prototyping it for the, for the, for the, for the NP system, NP hard systems uh, researcher. And the NP hard systems researcher said, oh, how are you doing this? How are you getting so good results uh, so quickly? And he said, well, okay, well, look at this. So, so what I did was you have each node and then you code in the level of frustration as a color code. Uh, according to how frustrated it is, you're all thinking, how stupid, of course we do that, right? But, but, but so, so when you have the level of frustration of each one of them, then you play the game by just clicking the most frustrated ones. But, but then he said, ah, in all the years, in that particular, so, so that particular way of phrasing it in mathematics, they hadn't sort of come up with. And so it's, it's just, um, it's, not, it's not saying that we've solved the problem completely, but it's just to again say that changing our point of view uh, uh, and bringing in other perspectives either ourselves or new expertises can really help to sort of uh, view the problem from a new angle that may make it much, much simpler to come up with these good ideas. So, but we want to do this systematically, and the way to do this systematically is uh, what we are trying to develop now is what we call a social science super collider infrastructure. Uh, in which we can start to address the problems that are existing in the social sciences. Maybe you've heard about it. There are problems that many of the cool results coming out of there cannot be reproduced. And they cannot be reproduced because many of the social science results are sort of based on labs in Western universities, and it's usually psychology students who are the lab rats for these experiments, and, that, and there are not so many in a room. So that means that it's very hard to get sort of statistical significance in those experiments. So what we're trying to do is to create sort of a new infrastructure in which we can sort of move out of the dimension of, of size, the number of people, duration, the complexity of the interactions that we can have. So we bring these social science questions out in the world. And, and this, this example of controlling the experiment and turning that into social science was sort of one of the examples of this. And if you, so, so this is, the, this is uh, the problem of weird, which is uh, that, that the participants are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, and so, so, we're not really, so we're not really, when we're learning something, then we're not really sampling from the whole world population. That's another problem. So what we, what we dream about is to create a game like this, a World of Warcraft game. Uh, we have millions of people going around in a simulated world, but now, unlike in the World of Warcraft, it is us as the researchers who decide all the small rules in the world, which means now, for the first time ever, we can actually start to actively and hypothesis-based simulate macroscopic behavior. So not just taking something from the real, uh, from the unreal world of, of, of computer games and allowing sort of, okay, so the computer programmers and the people who want to make money off of the games to define the rules, but we can actually make A-B testing in which we have a society and we have another society which is almost identical to that, and then this is the way to get much better data. And this is sort of, in this world here, um, a point that if we want to learn something, then big data is not always better data because uh, data that is not generated with a particular hypothesis in mind is also messy data. And so that means that even having a little bit less data than you get on World of Warcraft could actually be much, much more efficient. And so that's what we're trying to do. Here are some of the, some of the games that, that, that we are sort of uh, developing and, and launching. Here's a game that I think is really cool because it's, a, it's, it's a, an investigation of the emergence and attitudes towards inequality. It's really strange that in our society, uh, if you take all of the sort of all the small lab experiments that you can have in social science, there's a game called Domination. So Helena and I, we will play a game. I have 100 crowns, and I will give Helena some of these, and then she accepts it or rejects it. And if she rejects it, then we will not, uh, none of us will get anything. And so from all of those experiments, it always turns out that if we were rational, homo economicus, then if I gave you one crown, you should accept it, because one crown is more than zero crowns, right? But what we see is everyone says, 
raises a finger or something like that at me and says, no, thank you if I, if I, if I give you one crown. So on a microscopic level, we all hate, as humans, we all hate inequality, and yet and we look out to the societies, inequality is there all the time. And so what's the basis of that? What we're trying to do here is to simulate a small society, not so, not so large, but now we can actually sort of initialize that society with unequal distribution of wealth in, let's say, two different ways. One in which everyone sort of had a lottery, and then some people are rich, some people are poor. That's sort of the simulation of an aristocracy where, where if you're rich, you probably are just a lucky son of a bitch who, who, who inherited it, right? And then another one in which we just play a small game first, and then that game score it co combines into the initial wealth that you have, which means you have a meritocracy, which means now we're simulating the attitude towards inequality in a, in a, in a society in which there's a general feeling that if you're rich, you probably deserved it. And this can sort of uh, tell us something about this. On a, that was a little bit sidetracked, but then so, so, so on, on getting back a little bit to, to the big data and what is happening in sort of the machine learning, one of the, one of the big problems in current society is that we are seeing sort of an accumulation of, of big data on fewer and fewer tech companies. And so, so this is the illustration, one illustration of this, right? And that is that, that these big tech companies, because they have so much data, because they have so much computational power available, then they can provide services that are so specialized, so personalized, that we willingly give up more data to them, and they become even better. And that means that they can sort of stick their arms in, in all kinds of uh, 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 areas of our life. And so, so this has brought lots of cool things to it, but it also is a democratic problem, because um, we are seeing, so, so the the algorithms that are sort of trained, the neural networks underneath are sort of the trade secrets because that, I mean, this is, if you have access to all the data, you can train that network and then you can provide that service, which means that it's very, very hard for, for companies, for instance, that are smaller and that don't have access to all of that data and all those insights about what it means to be human to provide a service that is sort of complementary or that's sort of, let's say, another Facebook or another Google or something like that, that can provide just as personalized a service to them as we are. So what we're trying to do in a small project is that we are trying to do cognitive profi profiling like Cambridge Analytica, uh, except at the universities. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do is then to take some of the uh, validated cognitive tasks that are extremely boring and then create them in the form of games. And so, so we've taken these, these here and then we've created some, some small mini games. So it's a collection of mini games and our, our vision is now to have the whole Danish population and then the whole world population play these games and that will provide us with data, so let's say on par with, with Google and Amazon when we can then sort of start to learn something about the behavior of humans, what it means to be human and the ambition is then that then we publish it. So we don't publish your cognitive profile or something like that, but, but we publish the, the, the sort of findings, the general findings of how it is. And so we can hope that with this and these insights, it become much simpler to, let's say, if you, if you want to... So, so I'll give you an idea. Uh, maybe it's not so good, so that's why I give it to you. Uh, but so, so, so if you want to make lots of money, uh, at least my wife wants to buy it, is a digital uh, social media assistant that knows and tracks all of our social media activities and lets us know with a warning sign that now we are being manipulated. Okay, right? So, so when you run all of the, let's say you're on Facebook and you're getting served the newsfeed and everything, you, it knows what the kind of algorithms that, that are being employed against us, recognizes them and asks us, do you want to be uh, submitted to those kinds of algorithms? And you need to know the algorithms. You need to know what the human sort of manipulability is in order to do that. And that's what we're trying to, trying to, trying to do. If you want to, uh, you can play the game. It's called Skill Lab Science Detective. We had a collaboration with, with DR in Denmark about sort of trying to cognitively map the Danish population. Uh, if you want something fun, not scientific yet, you can go to, uh, it's called, uh, ra -ra -ra, you Google uh, Denmark's new Superjane, and then you'll get into this, all of these different articles. And, and, and one of them, there's a paper here where you can click your region, and then when you click your region, which is then the Copenhagen region here, for instance, then you will see sort of what the predominant skills are in that region, and you can also click the stupid people over here on the West Coast and see, see what they are good and stupid at. So, so this is not, I mean, we'll put much more data in there when we learn much more. Now it's just a call to action to make it a little bit, uh, let's say, fun. So, so the cool thing about this is that uh, uh, we get sort of a nearly flat age distribution. No social scientists have something like, have access to something like this here. Uh, flat age distribution, it falls off, but, but that's because people are dying here. And we have sort of equal gender splits also. And so we're really sampling, let's say this is on a Danish scale, but we're really sampling the Danish population at large like this here. 
So, so I think that's that's really promising. Ah, here was it. So I'll flick through it. So you have to go. So you have to go yourself if you want to see what kind of. Uh, so what we did was we we found sort of what are the sort of the action characters that are most re uh, reminiscent of this. Okay, so I think I have four minutes uh, four minutes left, um, and and I just want to end with 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 one thing that I think is really uh, 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 cool and 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 urgent at the moment, and that is when we talked about. What is it that we need to get better at as individuals and as human species? Then uh, everyone is talking about we need to. Well, half of the people are saying we need to code, and the other people, half of the people are saying we need to be able to to transition and transferable skills. And some people are saying both. So, so, but but if we want to make a transition of our educational system to cater to the fact that all of the jobs that are here today are, are extremely modified and, and many, many, many new ones will, will exist in just a decade from now. We need a completely different educational system. And so we've been traveling around the world and talking to, to politicians around the world and asking them, how is it that you want to play a part in, in, in funding the complete revamping of our educational system, not just educational system, but also sort of further education system? And, and they said, this is important. But we have no money because we uh, we have to negotiate also about old old age checks and everything. So there's always something urgent, and so the governments cannot solve this problem. So the question is, how do we solve the problem for humanity, which I think is the most urgent problem, of educating ourselves and our youth? And so our bid on that is a new um, is a new cryptocurrency based project. Uh, we call it the learning economy. And so what we are doing is that we are introducing, um, so, so we talked about this at the uh, General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, a couple of months, uh, a month ago, and it'll be sort of formally introduced, if all goes well, at the G20 meeting uh, in uh, Buenos Aires a little bit later this month. And so the concept of that is we have a blockchain-based system, new economy, so it's a cryptocurrency, and the idea of it is that unlike are the other cryptocurrencies, and on, unlike the national bank, in which we really have to place trust in sort of an arbitrary thing that we says, okay, well, uh, Bitcoin has value because I believe that it has value, or the plastic card that I have in my hand has value because the national bank says that it has value, then what we're trying to do is to sort of return currency back to what we can call the gold standard. At the old days, you had gold, and you have, if we agree that gold is, is golden, is valuable, then you believe in the currency that you have, except that, that we need something new. And what we're saying is that we, we'll base this whole economy, maybe the world economy, on the value of learning. And so rather than mining new coins in these educational coins, you, rather than mining them by mining an algorithm, you mine in the world by taking new educational modules. And so we are partnering up with, uh, next year, partnering up with Duolingo, for instance. And so the idea is that you can, if you are a refugee, you are in a foreign country, then you can uh, learn the language and you get paid for it and you can restart your, your new life in that way. So, it's, so the idea is that it's a blockchain-based sort of economy. It is um, based such that when you mine new coins, then one third of the new coins go to the learner one third goes to the people who have generated the educational content, so that goes into creating better content, and one third goes to the investors, which means that now, maybe for the first time, we can really invest in education. So we can go to the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffets, and rather than saying that they philanthropically have to donate money, then they can invest in education. And this investment will be a sound investment as long as we all agree, one, to start using these coins, and two, to keep educating ourselves. And so that's the idea we have. If, if the video uh, is, is, is stopped, then we, we, have, we think we have something like $500 million of investment capital secured, and, and um, MasterCard is we're discussing with them that they will sort of be, be, be responsible for using, being able to use that uh, sort of in, uh, in the real world. So, so this is just an example of, let's say, there are, there are problems out there and there are solutions out there, and, and we, um, so I'm an external advisor to this project, and so we went to, we went to MIT. They are the world experts on blockchain, economy, blockchain. And, and, uh, and, and it turned out that although they, all the engineers at the MIT, they know how to make blockchain systems, none of them had any idea what to use it for. And this sort of illustrates that with this new technology and there's lots of new possibilities arising, we need to open our horizon. And that's why these transferable skills are so important. When there was the PricewaterhouseCoopers made a report and they said, what are the kinds of skills that CEOs will be needing in the future? Digital skills and STEM skills were all the way down 
saying this is not very important and this is not very, well, uh, it's relatively not important and it's relative, relatively easy to secure, whereas everything that was up here, difficult to attain and very, very valuable were the transferable skills. So collaboration, leadership, and all these different creativity skills. And that's because we need to take these new products and then not going from, final thing, that we, so Google has for many years had this not, not very secret strategy of saying AI first, right? And say, so, okay, so in every instance and in every aspect, we just put AI first. And if we put AI first, then in the long run, we will sort of benefit from that. And so there's a discussion in, in, the, in the government at the moment what to spend, the, whatever it becomes, 180 million crowns that Tom Yellows wants to spend on AI. Um, and some people are saying, we need to teach everyone who has a company to put AI first so that they can become better at taking every situation and placing AI inside of it. And what I try to, to tell Tommy is to, uh, to say we should educate our companies and citizens in putting hybrid intelligence first, putting the human and the computer interface first and finding out what is it kind of interface that will augment us in the best way. And I think that was uh, my cue to stop talking. Thank you very much. <laughs>